Now we're moving on to part three, uh, which is the second reading. But before I begin the second reading, uh, which is a description of the end of the world, which it's nice to think about once in a while. I mean, our world will end in a couple of years when we die. The whole thing is going to end sometime. Why is it nice to know that? It gives our thought edges. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to retire, and then I'm going to... Wait, 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 wait. Have you asked God? You got any ideas about this? See, give it perspective. But I want, before we do that, to just look at part of this psalm, 85. And uh, the verses that they use mostly are from 9 to 14. I may quote a few of the extras before we get there. Um... It starts off, You once favored, Lord, your land, restored the good fortune of Jacob. You forgave the guilt of your people and pardoned all their sins. You withdrew all your wrath, turned back your burning anger. You did that once. We need it again. Who else would have that kind of confidence in God? We sinned, you punished us, you brought us back, now we sinned again. We need your help again. Restore us once more, God our Savior. Abandon all your wrath against us. You know what the wrath of God is? Really? God's not mad. He never was. He cannot be mad. He's confronting the fire of the love of God. And it's so powerful. And if we're stuck to our sins, we feel like we're being pushed away. And we're being pushed away by the power and the drive of the love of God. If we would get a little adjusted to the love of God, we wouldn't be pushed away. How do we get adjusted? Stop sinning. Pretty simple. Well, I can't stop by myself. Everybody knows that, especially God. So go to Him. Make a novena to Our Lady. Anyway, the wrath of God is the experience of the power and force of His love to which we are so unequal, we feel we're being pushed away, and we're not. Okay. Will you be angry with us for another? Drag out your anger for all generations. Please give us life again. And what's so smart about this psalm? They know where to go for life. They don't say, Lord, just adjust the budget. Straighten out the stock market. You know, uh, Stop all these hurricanes, and we'll be happy. No. It says, give us life again. Then we will rejoice in you. Show us your love, Lord. Grant us your salvation. That's the first part of the psalm. It's, it's a prayer. Now comes a prophetic word. You see, this psalm was it records a moment in the life of the temple, probably, a liturgy. And now comes a word of the Lord, you see. And it says... Uh, I will hear what God proclaims, the Lord, for he proclaims shalom to his people. Do you understand? Shalom. Shalom is what? Shalom is the presence in our relationship of everything that ought to be there, and the presence in your life of everything that will be there, should be there. If I say, you know, over if I'm over in, in Jerusalem and I say, you know, Shalom, Mashlam Cha, how is your Shalom? I mean, how is life going? Is everything in order for you? You see what I mean? The other guy says, Shlomitov, my Shalom is good. Or if I owe you, oh, a hundred shekels, and I say, Eshalem Lecha. I pay back to you. Did you hear it? Eshalem. I make the relationship in order by giving you back your money. You see, it means the presence in a relationship of everything that ought to be there. Shalom. It just doesn't mean fat and happy. You see, it's relational. So when we say to each other on the street, Shalom, we mean, I wish everything to be right for you. 
Understand that? So here it says, you see, uh, the Lord proclaims shalom for his people. Near indeed is his salvation for those who fear him. The kavod is dwelling in our land. Uh, I have to stop and get on with the, the second letter of Peter. But do you understand how getting the right com- kind of commentary on the Old Testament shows us that it's one Bible. One Bible. The idea that the Old Testament is the God of wrath. The God of wrath, in the sense he shows his love and we're so unequal to it, we run away. We feel it. We feel rebuffed by the love of God. If you're smart, you duck and hang on there. Let it all blow over you. And then raise your hand and say, I repent. And you're in good shape. You think I exaggerate? I don't. I promise you I don't. Okay. Now the second reading is from Second Peter 3, 8 to 14. You see, this is a part where Second Peter, you know, comes after First Peter. Yeah, you know, okay, everybody knows that. But it's a different kind of letter. And he's saying, look, fellas, don't be stupid. We know the Lord is coming back. He's going to end the world. When? We don't know. But you're, you're smart. You'll be ready. Because even if the world goes on, it's going to end for you in, in not many years. You know, you, you're going to step out of it. It may keep going, but you're going to die. So, do not ignore this one fact, beloved Agapiti, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. This is like Psalm 90. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some regard delay, you see? But he is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, why do we have this at Advent? Because there's a new coming of the Lord, a new presence. Be smart, you know. If you read the paper every day looking for bargains, read the Bible looking for bargains. And here's a bargain. Come back to me. Confess your sins. Be reinstated with me. I'll feed you on my body and my blood. And if you die, you're going to just come right with me. You might have to go get straightened out a bit in purgatory. But you know what purgatory is? It's seeing our sins in their true, awful reality. Awful. But through the eyes of Christ. So we see them through the eyes of compassion. So what happens? We weep. We weep. Out of sheer gratitude and relief. And we see how bad they are. But we see it through the eyes of mercy. That explains why the saints are always weeping over their sins. And why we pray for the gift of tears. To see that and weep. That's the second baptism, according to um, Gregory the New Theologian. And that's the preparation you need for baptism in the Spirit. You've got to have this gift of tears. Weep over your sins. It's not from fear. Look at all the saints who wept. You know, they say St. Ignatius wept so much, and he had a bunch of sins. I mean, he was murdering guys, sleeping with women. You know, he wasn't exactly uh, like some of his disciples, like St. John Berkman's, you know. No, he wasn't. But he was weeping over real sins because he was overwhelmed by the mercy of Jesus Christ. You see? That's what he was weeping over. So here it says, you see, um, he is patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. This is a theme you can tell from the number of Paul uses it, Peter uses it, it's in the Gospels. A thief sneaks in. You know, you don't even know he's there. Or he comes and he's finished his job 
and you're out of everything you ever owned, and you finally catch on. But when he comes, you're not ready. It was the Lord who first used this image. And it's so powerful, so beautiful, and so touching. You're living in your little house in Palestine, little mud house. The thieves there most of the time, they dig a hole in the wall and just sneak in through the back, take whatever they want and sneak out again. And you're on the front porch, you know, smoking your hashish or something, and you miss it. Jesus said, don't do that. Be alert. And the image is so powerful. Paul uses it. We saw that in Thessalonians. Now Peter's using it, you see? And then the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar. The clements, the elements will be dissolved by fire. And the earth and everything done on it will be found out. So it's coming. No more destroyed by water, but maybe by fire. The maybe is my hesitation. I'm not sure. Peter doesn't say anything about maybe. He just says, the elements will be dissolved by fire. That's a tradition. In other words, everything's going to end. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That is promised. Promised in Isaiah. And it's one of those texts that it's promised and it's not yet here. So there are promises, prophecies in the Old Testament that are yet to be fulfilled. St. Thomas is great at this. You know, one of the ones he loves a lot is Isaiah 51, 3, and then the world will be filled with praise. I'm paraphrasing. And Thomas said, well, of course, we don't see that yet, but we will. But we will. So if everything is dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be? Conducting yourselves in holiness and devotion, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and the elements melted by fire. But according to his promise, we await, and to get you have the, with the promise, is the one I just quoted from Isaiah, you see, we await new heavens, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. If you walk into a group of like very fervent Christians, you relax, right? Nobody's going to make fun of you. Nobody's going to insult you. Certainly nobody's going to rob you. And you relax. Why? Because of the presence of Christ in that. That's why people live in community. You know? To enjoy that and prosper and grow because of it, you see? But if we work hard, this is what every parish ought to be. You see? Uh, righteousness, we await a new heaven, a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. So if St. Timothy's parish in Peoria, if there is one, uh, we're all to come together, forgive each other, give their lives to the Lord, repent for their sins, and strive to obey the Lord in love and in trust, because we love and trust Him. My goodness, wouldn't that be heaven? Of course it would. Not quite heaven. But that's what he's saying. You can do this. Beloved, since you await such things, be eager to be eager to be found without spout or blemish before him at peace. Shalom. In your life, everything is where it ought to be. There's no unforgiveness in your heart. There's no, you see, anger, you know, every, there's respect for everybody in your heart. You know, you're caring for your children and they're caring for you. Shalom. That's how we get ready for the coming of the Lord.